As of 2023, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone has sold over 120 million copies. It's hard not to slip into hyperbole when discussing this once-in-a-generation book and series that has broken every possible barrier you can imagine. And I'm so excited to announce that we are publishing the Story Grid Masterwork Guide to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone on July 31st, 2024, Harry Potter's birthday. Written by StoryGrid certified editor Savannah Gilbo and edited by StoryGrid certified editor Abigail K. Perry, this is the writer's guide to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and you're going to learn so much about what went into the writing of this book and how you can apply it to your own writing. The introduction is a deep dive into the macro elements of the story. So we start by looking at the genre and obligatory moments and conventions, and then we do a deep dive into the characters and the 20 core scenes throughout the entire story. And then Savannah takes us scene by scene and does a deep story analysis of every single scene and extensive notes on how each scene plays into the entire novel and the entire series. When I first read this, I was blown away. I learned so much as a writer going through this analysis of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And I've been a fan of this book for a very long time, read it many times, done my own analysis of it. And yet going through Savannah and Abigail's notes and the writing and everything that went into this, I learned so much more. So I'm so excited to share this book with you. Now, my name is Tim Grawl. I'm the CEO of StoryGrid, where we help you build the skills, write a book and leave your legacy. I'm the author of The Threshing, Running Down a Dream, your first 1,000 copies, and my new book is The Shithead. My partner, Sean Coyne, is the creator and founder of StoryGrid, and everything we teach here at StoryGrid and all of the analysis that we did in this Harry Potter Masterwork Guide is based on his methodology, his research, and his writing for over 30 years. This video is a two-part interview with Savannah and Abigail where we walk through what they learned as editors and what you're going to learn as a writer from this masterwork guide. Now, if you already know you want a copy of the book, you can click down the description and pre-order your own copy. Or if it's past July 31st, you can just go ahead and order a copy. But either way, let's go ahead and jump into this interview with Savannah Gilbo and Abigail K. Perry to talk Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. As we get started here in this conversation, um, I don't think people, a lot of times when they think about the kind of analysis we do at StoryGrid and what goes into this, like how deep dive it is and how long it takes and how, how much um, effort goes into it. And uh, it's not like writing kind of any other type of book, I don't think. And so I wanted to hear from both of you first, just what is it about Harry Potter that made you think like, okay, this is worth spending this much time going basically word by word through this entire book. Um, like why, what inspire, what about Harry Potter inspires that kind of due diligence on the book? Yeah. And it is no joke. So it is a project that can last as long as you let it last. Um, but for me, Harry Potter, so I was 11 when the first book came out, Harry was also 11. So I literally grew up with Harry um, which was really fun. And I had, I was always a voracious reader, but I was reading a lot of adult fantasy, adult horror, adult sci-fi. Um, and this was kind of the first time I saw a kid my own age doing really cool things. So that was really special for me. And then as the series continued, Harry faced things that I was dealing with, like a lot of death. I dealt with a lot of death as a teen and, you know, in my early 20s. And my parents weren't quite equipped to help me deal with that. So Dumbledore, McGonagall, Hagrid, Lupin, Sirius, they became my mentors. And um, watching Harry as a young person my own age deal with stuff like that was pretty instrumental in how I dealt with it and how I became the human I am today. So to say it holds a special place in my own heart is kind of an understatement. Also, you'll see soon that Abigail and I are huge Harry Potter nerds still. So <laughs> that's me. I am seconding all of that. Uh, I'm 89 and I believe Harry Potter is 87. So we're right in the same age group. And when these came out, these were these and when these came out, these were really the books that I read. So I 
my background is film and I uh, have always loved film. I've always been, uh, you know, raptured by movies, but Harry Potter was the book series that I read so much, so many times in a row. When mom said and dad said to go to bed, I was up hours with the flashlight underneath the covers with Harry Potter. And to the point where my mom was uh, like, Abby, you need to read other books. And I was like, but these are the ones I love. I want to read these again. Uh, ever. <laughs> yeah, the, the funny story in, in my household was that when Order of the Phoenix was coming out, I was flying out to see my grandma in Indiana, and I was insistent that I had to pack all four books in my suitcase so I could read them the week of. So at the end of the week when it was released at midnight when I was there, I could read all four. And uh, my parents didn't know that I packed all four books. And you know, Goblet of Fire is a heavy book. So of course, my suitcase was over the weight limit. And they were like, why is why is your suitcase over 50 pounds? Now we have to pay this extra money. And they, <laughs> my dad, I remember this. My dad is like unzipping my suitcase. He opens it up and he's like, yeah, you have four giant books in your suitcase. You're not going to read these this week. But I was insistent that we needed to pay the extra money so I could bring my books because Kindle was not a thing back then. And uh, I, you know, ha I just have always loved it. I love it for the characters and I love it for the action. And we're talking about a story of ultimate good and evil. And that has always been something that I'm drawn to. That is something that I feel is rooted in my seeing meaning in life about seeing how can we be the best versions of ourselves and watching someone my age struggle with what it is to balance good and evil and to uh, embrace darkness within you but make choices in order to be the best versions of yourselves and to fight for others uh, in order to protect family protect home that and, and sacrifice and making those sacrifices because of out of love and ultimately like the root of the story is love making choices for love and light and uh you know some people love star wars and that good and evil story and for me it was lord of the rings and harry potter and those were that was just it, it is it, it is a core belief of my of existence to me and seeing the fun of that of course the school setting who wouldn't want to go to hogwarts i'm still waiting for my letter <laughs> I won't be past 11, but I always will be waiting for my letter. And just the, the fun and the magic of it, it just spoke to me on such a human level. And friendship, loyalty, courage, those are things that I strive to, to be in my life. And I know that I will fail at them constantly, but those are core in my belief of what can be a good way to live, to be a good human being. And uh, yeah, they, they're great examples of that. So I have no problem spending hours and hours and hours in these pages. I will never fail to fall out of love with these books. And it's a whole different experience analyzing it as a masterwork. <laughs> You'll see. But I think part of the fun that Span and I have had with the masterwork guide analysis is that we are still learning something every time we return to it. And we're talking about Span and I are super nerds here. So we are have read these books every year, maybe multiple times a year since they were published. And like we were, we were there from the beginning and we're going to be there until the day I die. And I think that it is just like, it's, it's mind blowingly fascinating to me that I learn something new every time I return to these books. That book is special. There's something about that book. If I can learn something new every time I return and we're talking, you know, 20 plus years, every time I return to it. Okay. We were talking about a master. Yeah. And you're going to die, Abigail, because we've never talked about the airport story, but I have almost exactly the same story, but I was with a friend's family and they made me unpack the suitcase and they were like, what do we do with you? And we were going to Costa Rica when Order of the Phoenix came out. So I remember reading the scene when Dumbledore died and it was lightning and thundering around and there was like this big storm and I slammed the book and I was like, I just could not believe it. And then I didn't want to talk to anybody. And so I'm on vacation with my friend's family and they're like, we're not big readers. What the heck's going on? So really funny we have the same story and speaking of reading the books a billion times during the, the analysis i broke my copy finally it started coming apart in the middle and the pages were coming out so yeah. it's dedication it means then it was loved yes I like to say about the teen rabbit reference it, you made it real i made it real yeah it was love you know it's funny um i didn't get into harry potter until they had been out a little bit not till all of them had been out but until the first few had been out a little bit 
And um, I started reading them when I was in Cyprus. And so we're in, and it's it was uh, northern Cyprus. And so it's like pretty remote and rural there. And I remember uh, the place we were staying didn't have internet. And I had finished, I forget which one I had finished. I'd finished one of them. And I'm like, I have to. I have to read the next one. Like I got to get started. Mm -hmm. There's no bookstores where I can get Harry Potter in Northern Turkish Cyprus, you know? Um, so I ended up going, um, I had, okay. So I had bought them. So they were at my house, but I hadn't brought them cause I, you know, I didn't think I'd get this into it. So, um, I had a Kindle and so I walked up this to this place. It was like the only place that had internet and I used pirate Bay to download a pirated copy of them. So this was before they were on Kindle. So somebody had sat down and typed out the whole oh book. Gosh. There were like misspellings and typos and like all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But I managed to find a version that I could get on my Kindle so I could go back and like actually keep reading the books. So I totally pirated them. I did pay for them. I had actual paper copies back at home, but we couldn't take them all the way across the world. They're too big. Um, so, uh, that was like my story of like, okay, I have to keep reading these. I have to know what happens. And so I'm like up in this little coffee shop in Turkish Cyprus. Nobody understands English there. And I'm like pirating these books so I can get them on my Kindle so I can read them. Uh, yeah. So I think what's interesting about your perspective. So, you know, I've, you know, you hear so much about people that love Harry Potter um, and have loved it since they were children. And it means so much to them and a lot of what you said, but now that you've become so acquainted with the books, cause I was trying to think, I was like, I wonder if there's anybody other than JK Rowling that knows the books as well as you two do right now, because I don't think anybody sat down and done the kind of word by word, sentence by sentence analyzation of it. So, you know, the question is always like, well, why did these books like hit the market and become these crazy bestsellers over so many years, as opposed to all the other magic books and all the other, you know, fantasy books and, uh, and even books based on kids. Like there's, there's, you know, there's lots of books that have each of those elements. So now that you've, you like stepping out of what they meant to you personally, and you've looked at them with this really logical hat on, what do you think is uh, it made these these particular books? Um, and you know, we're talking specifically about Philosopher's Stone or, or Sorcerer's Stone. Um, what what do you think made them become what they were? I think when Abigail and I talk about it, there's three main things we kind of keep coming back to. One of them, of course, is characters because you know Harry's the underdog that we all want to root for, and we want him to succeed and have a better life and find love and belonging. But also there's kind of someone for everybody in the cast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can relate to Harry, but we can also totally identify with Hagrid. I do because I love animals and I'm just as, you know, I want my dogs to call me mummy, right? Like he <laughs> he does. So, you know, and you you can relate to the teacher of McGonagall who's strict and maybe the ones like in book two, Professor Lock, uh, Lockhart. Am I saying that right, Abigail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm right. Okay. So, um... Yeah, you can you can relate to anybody like the teacher like Lockhart, who's um, he's goofy and silly. Right. And so characters are a big deal. Um, animal characters, too. I think they totally count Hedwig. You know, we all want to pet owl and things like that. So that's number one characters. I think number two, of course, the world building. It's super immersive, um, super, you know, you feel like you're there. And also, as we study it, we realize every single little detail counts for something. And to me, as someone who is world building for my own fantasy series, that's amazing and magical. Um, and then third that we see is it weaves together the external plot and the internal character arc so dang well that you can't separate them. And so to us, we're like, this is the most fascinating thing we want to get into and nerd out and figure out how to do this in our own writing, because we're both working on fiction stories and um, need to world build and stuff like that too. Yeah. And to build off of that, uh, that internal and external marriage is key for me. And Sven and I talked about this, how I think that any true masterwork does this and they're inseparable. Any true masterwork shows because stories are about, are about change, right? So we need to see character growth and we need to see plot development. Two biggest things that you need to see in a story. How you execute that 
is where the magic is made. And I think when we look at characters, because there is a giant cast in Harry Potter, if you do the onstage characters in a chapter, you can get 20 plus characters in a chapter, you know? But all of them have purpose. And they all come into play as setups and payoffs in this like really just unbelievable way. And when we say no line is wasted, that is truly the case here. One thing about Harry Potter, and this is also why uh, I think you study as a masterwork, you never ever use this as a comparable type. And part of the reason for that is because, and when I say compare, like when you're pitching, if you're ever pitching, don't use this comparable title because you, you know, there is no next Harry Potter. I think that's the thing. It's like Harry Potter is its own thing. Now it's a franchise. It's more than a book. It's ubiquitous. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from it as a master. And part of the reason for that is because we go from middle grade to YA. So very few times do you ever see a story actually cross categories within genre. And we do this successfully because we age with Harry. Um, you know, when you love fantasy stories, there's a shallow learning curve and there's a steep learning curve. And usually a book does one of the two. Harry Potter is a shallow learning curve, meaning that we learn the world with Harry. That's my bread and butter. I love shallow learning curves because I think that I get to experience the story in a way that helps me just like comprehend it more. Savannah can, you know, she's a master in all fantasy and she can do the steep learning curve and the shallow learning curve. For me, I'm just like, I like to take it step by step, although I enjoy some steep learning curves, but I'm going to gravitate more towards the shallow learning curve because I think I wrap my head around it more. What I think Harry Potter does because it is a shallow learning curve and because it crosses middle grade into YA is that we get really complicated with what a character has to, the world is complicated. I'll say that first, right? And it gets really complicated as Harry ages. So when Savannah says that this, these books help teach him about death, they helped me. I, I really am drawn to stories about grief in any way. Um, I've had a lot of grief in my life. And I think that you're aging with Harry in a way that it's confusing and you're struggling with it at different levels and different complexities as you go through each story. And the way that you can deal with an internal story that allows someone to experience poor human condition lessons in a coming of age arc, but not have to dump everything at you in each book you're able to handle the layers of complexity of what life is and how it challenges you in different ways at different times at different age groups because you get a taste of that each one. There's a reason why we deal with Cedric Diggory dying in Cobblet of Fire and not dealing with death in Sorcerer's Stone. In Sorcerer's Stone, we're dealing with can you rise to the expectation of what society has just deemed you of in celebrity status? And where do you fall in that? And like, that's something that we can we can work with. And then as you get into Chamber of Secrets, like the stakes being raised, that's something that I'm doing Chamber of Secrets. And one of my main focuses when I'm analyzing Chamber of Secrets is how do you raise the stakes? How do you, how do you let, like, how do you get better each book? You know, and like for me, it does, it succeeds every single time. And that's what I think is so magical because it feels like we truly do just roll into the next book has higher stakes. The next bo next books has higher stakes. How does she level up the stakes every single time? And the plot twist and how she does it. Like, I know that when I was doing the debates, I know Sorcerer's Stone is we're going to focus on today, but as a series as a whole, Snape is one of my all-time favorite characters. No one will ever be able to convince me otherwise. And I remember being in it and being like, is he good? Is he bad? Is he good? Is he bad? Is he good? Is he bad? You know, and it's like, I think that uh, seeing... As an adult, this is something that Disney does. Um, that why I love, love, love Disney is that they can write a story and it can speak to an older age group and a young age group at the same time. And I think that Harry Potter can do that. And that's why I love it. Every time I read it, I learn something different every time I read it because I can understand McGonagall and I can understand Dumbledore in a way that I never would have been able to understand them at 11, at 15, at 20, you know? So I think that's part of it. The characters are rich because we can understand perspectives and seeing what a character holds information from another can create conflict. But at the same time, it shows you like who the character truly is and why 
secrets are kept and all that comes out. So the mystery plot is wild in all of these, despite it being an action story. You're such a nerd about it. And I love it, Abigail. <laughs> um, if So I know we're sticking to book one, but we did an experiment on our podcast where we were looking at the chapter one from each Harry Potter book and watching how she brought us back to a familiar place and raised the stakes and broaden the scope of the stakes and the conflict and it's super fascinating so someday hopefully we can do a, an episode about the series uh because we would all nerd out on that but um the other thing i think that makes the first harry potter book really interesting and successful is that there are multiple layers of stakes so harry has personal school kid stakes he wants to make friends and get sorted into the right house and things like that um, then there's dangerous stakes at school, like, you know, dragons that want to blow your head off and things like that in a forbidden forest and a corridor where there's a three headed dog. And then there's worldwide stakes, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, have to do more with Voldemort and things like that. But there's also multiple layers of conflict, which is super cool as well. So we have Draco, the school day bully, Snape, the, you know, bullying teacher, and then all the way up to Quirrell slash Voldemort. Um, and it's amazing how she balances all of that. So let's let's keep talking about characters because yeah. this is one of the things that I think writers struggle with a lot is like what characters to put in their book. Um, how many characters, you know, uh, how do you, how do you make these decisions uh, around these characters? Because you have great books that I mean, you have great books that there's one character and then you have books like Harry Potter that there's a whole cast of characters. Yeah. So what can a writer learn by looking at the characters in Harry Potter about what it means to create your own cast of characters for your own book? I think the first thing I always like to think about is why. Why do you want to do whatever you want to do? So if you want to have a small cast, why? What does that do for your story? If you want to have a big cast, what does that do? And in, in Harry Potter, there's a school setting. So, of course, we have to have it populated with students and teachers. That's, you know, kind of the base layer. And then it's, okay, how do I make this cast of students and teachers really count? You know, and so she kind of puts the spotlight on a select few that matter and let other people fade into the background. Like we're meeting um, on the train, for example. We meet at different times Fred and George, who are going to be significant, Ron and Hermione, Neville, Draco and his bully friends. Um, and we see a bunch of other kids, but we're not putting the spotlight on them because in this book, they don't really matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I would say focus on what matters and, and just have a reason why you're doing things instead of, I just want to have a big cast, right? Because <laughs> um, I see a lot of writers that do that. They're like, I just want a big cast and I just want six point of view characters. And, you know, you can do whatever you want, but sometimes that's not the best reasoning to do that. So talking about characters is uh, one of my favorite ca topics ever to talk about because that is my number one element that I look for in a story. You don't care about stakes if you don't care about characters. And with a cast of Harry Potter, I think that what you want to look at it is like life and that some people come in your life to make your life better, to teach you what like, you know, lessons that you need to learn in order to become a better version of yourself. Some people come in your life to teach you exactly what you don't want to be. And that creates conflict in a way that's sticky and uncomfortable and dangerous in some times. And I think that what Harry Potter does is, again, it goes, for me, it goes back to always, I keep, at, I keep talking to my clients about this. What are your characters withholding from others? And that's why, like, even when it comes to dialogue, uh, some text is really important because we need to understand why a certain character has motivations to say or not say certain things and do or do not do certain things. And we all have our own reasons for that, but we're also limited by our own perspectives. And you need one another in order to become a better version of yourself. And when you look at there in Harry Potter, there are small groups and then there are big groups. So you're going to have your core three friends. You're going to have your trio of Harry, Hermione, and Ron. And there are going to be similarities between them. They are all in Gryffindor, right? But they're very different. And that is really important in any group dynamic that you decide to write. And I think that we do that in our own life as well. 
we tend to select people in our inner circle who are like us, but not like us. And when you do that, you're moving forward towards growth because they're going to challenge you become a better version of yourself. Now, like Harry and Ron, I think you argue are very similar in a lot of ways. But Ron has lived and breathed the wizarding world since the, you know, before he was conceived. You know, it's like his whole family is like all wizard all the time. They're also very humble, which is why Harry works with them, right? And I think that Harry doesn't know anything about the wizarding world. Without Ron, he doesn't succeed. Like when you look at, when, if you want to zero in really on Sorcerer Stone, we do not succeed in the trap door without Ron and without Hermite. He doesn't win. And the reason for that is because they have different skill sets. And he has chosen, this is because this whole series is about choices. And he has selected those in his life that he believes he feels are going to be helping him grow into the best version of himself, whether or not he knows it or not as a child. He does this now. And Hermione is the most different from the two boys. You know, she was, you learn later, the Sorting Hat was tr struggling between Ravenclaw and Gryffindor, but then subsided, um, went to, defaulted to Gryffindor for her. Uh, maybe she was choosing Gryffindor in her own way. I don't know. We'll see. But I think that ultimately, like, that was a struggle. We know that there was a struggle between Slytherin and Gryffindor for Harry. And I think that's part of, like, the beautiful lesson in general with all of these characters. You are sorted into different houses. And throughout the earlier books, as Sorcerer's Stone, uh, houses are really important in defining who characters are and categorizing them. And then it, that gets v very much more complicated as you go through the series and you start to learn that we have different abilities and we really have abilities of all house, but you tend to kind of prioritize which ones. So with characters in general, I am always, my number one thing is just looking at how, when you have a large cast or a small cast, how are the characters different from each other? And how are they, um, and how are they similar to one another? And through that, how does that help them face the obstacles that the plot is going to challenge them with? And how do they create obstacles and support each other or challenge each other as you go forward? Uh, it's one of the things that I always like to emphasize when you talk about antagonists. And we, Savannah kind of mentioned this earlier with levels, different, there's a hierarchy of antagonism. So in something like Harry Potter, you're having an action story. It's going to be a classic good and evil. There will be a villain. A villain exists. A villain is out for destruction in power, usually, right? There's also antagonists that are companions. Neville is an antagonist at one point in the final act of Harry Potter, right? And he's actually one of the more difficult ones. Dumbledore points this out. Ten points to Neville, you know, Neville Longbottom for standing up to your friends. Because that's challenging to face your friends as well, but you're doing what's good for each other. So I think that that's what you always want to be looking at is just if you have characters and you have a large cast or a small cast, are they different and are they similar? Are they sharing goals or not? A villain and a hero at its most bare bones have goals that are opposite, right? And it's like, that's what I always ask myself, what is each goal and how are they conflicting directly with one another? Because that is what ultimately creates the core of the story. And then on a scene level, how are you doing the same thing with your characters? Is there purpose to what they're existing and why they're existing there? Are you playing double duty, right? If you're going to name a character, they best be having a role. Yeah. And I heard you say a couple really key things like that kind of ties back to what I was saying about having a reason why. And you're saying we have friends like Hermione and Ron who help us learn the theme, who help us survive, who, you know, they serve a bigger function in the story than just being there because kids have friends. Right. And even the three layers of antagonism. There's three layers of that for a very specific reason. Like Voldemort is not in a, he doesn't have a body. He's on the back of some guy's head, right? So Harry can't really face him. Also, that's very purposeful from an author's perspective because an 11 year old who doesn't even barely know magic exists and he's trying to learn magic, he can't go up against a full like bodied wizard, dark wizard and survive, right? So there's a, I just love picking apart their reasons why. And then, you know, thinking about Snape, he, you can't just have in a, in a school um, setting with an 11-year-old protagonist, you can't just have adults who are the conflict, right? That wouldn't make sense. So we have Draco, who's kind of an echo of 
a Snape of a Voldemort. And like Abigail said, they're all working to teach Harry the same lesson and to also harm his ability to survive. Yeah. So it's really interesting, really well done. And I think that's part of the magic of the series as well, because you see all the characters supporting or main and how they grow. So taking Draco, for instance, uh, you know, when we get to Half-Blood Prince, he becomes a three-dimensional character. And for one through five, he's really two-dimensional. So it's like he is this, I'm here to create conflict for Harry in a bully scenario, right? We are arch enemies. And as soon as you get into Order of Phoenix, it gets a little stickier because we see how James and Snape had their very similar, mirrored, here's your foil approach, antagonism, you know, bully versus that, who's the bully? And I think that then you go into Half-Blood Prince and like Draco becomes super sympathetic because he becomes three-dimensional and because he, he is the prime example of a character who is struggling between living up to parental expectations of who he thinks he's supposed to be and fighting his innate nature of what he actually believes in and not really understanding what that even is and that struggle. And it's like, holy crap, like that's like, holy cannoli. I like to say like that is, if that's not a coming of age struggle, <laughs> then I don't know what is, right? So I think that when, um, when you're looking at all of these, it's really amazing to watch Sorcerer's Stone and see where characters are starting and then seeing how they grow. And I think that that's, you see it on the scene level and you see it in the in an individual book, and you see it across the series. It's just absolutely beautiful. And Tim, I think you're going to have a hard time keeping us a sorcerer stone because we just can't help it. We can't help talking about the other books. No, I think it's all I think it's all relevant, and and there's a lot in the notes in the book that are addressing the full series, and I, I, we're going to come and talk about those in a minute. But I do want to like bring up a couple things, like that are very. I don't know. I found helpful thinking through it of like, like the whole idea, you know, we talk a lot at story grid about, um, order and chaos. And so when I look at, uh, Harry, he's kind of in the middle of that spectrum. And then he's got these two friends that are very much in that order and chaos realm. Like Ron's obviously chaos and Hermione is order. And then even within the adults of McGonagall versus Hagrid, um, and so can you speak a little bit to that again, taking this idea of like, okay, if I'm going to look at Harry Potter and the cast of characters and how they serve the story, how do you look at it through that order and chaos lens? Yeah. I like to call Haggard Captain Chaos cause that's kind of what he is. Uh, but it's kind of like it exists within order and chaos and then it within, let's say order, there's good and bad People, you know, if we're thinking about the the battle between good and evil, there are good people that represent order, good people that represent chaos, and good people and bad people that represent uh, order, whatever, the opposite one. Uh, I don't know what I said before. Uh, so, like, for example, in just Hermione and Ron, right, we have Hermione's very order and Ron's very much chaos, but they're both good. They're both good influences on him. Uh, so I think that is really interesting for us to see and think about why... Why not have, you know, a Neville and a Hermione who are both kind of order? I mean, I guess Neville is a little bit of chaos, right? <laughs> He's like physical chaos. Um, but like, why not have two versions of Hermione that are good and ordered? Um, and, you know, it just it's interesting to think about our own characters that way. And it's interesting, too, that you said, Harry, you think Harry's kind of um, in the middle of order versus chaos. I think he is. But he's also in that good bucket, too. Right. So. The chaos is is kind of pulling him towards that bad side, but we see he we, he consistently refuses going to the dark side, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's think about the purpose of why there needs to be order, why there needs to be chaos, and then it's really cool to think outside the characters and how that even plays in world building because it's there too. Uh, the world when we meet um, Harry Harry in the opening chapter. He's a baby who just got rescued from uh, the site where his parents are killed. The world is in chaos, but in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the story progresses, we kind of go more towards chaos in a bad way if Voldemort were to succeed. So it's really interesting how chaos doesn't necessarily have to mean bad, but chaos to me means 
conflict and conflict means the opposite of what you expected or different than you expected. So I don't know. That's like a lot of thoughts, but it's interesting. Something that when you have order, you know what's going to happen next. So you feel right. safe, you know, you know, it, it brings safety, it, it predictability, but at the same time you lose out on new and creativity. So new things and creative things come from chaos. So yeah, it's right. not good or bad, but it is interesting how there are both ordered and chaotic figures on both the good and bad sides. Like, I feel like this is something we could probably draw like a four quadrant and start yeah. putting the characters in different places. And what I would guess is if we did that, and I think you, you know, you went so deep into the characters in the book, um, is that it would be pretty evenly distributed, right? We have, we have ordered and chaotic characters on the good side and order and chaotic characters on, uh, on the bad side and on the good side, so many good things come from Ron's chaos, right? Uh, and, and at the same time, Hermione kind of keeps everybody safe. And so I think it's, um, that is just so interesting to me, again, in a cast of characters so large that they seem to be pretty evenly distributed across all of those spectrums. Yeah, I think that's important too, because sometimes in drafts, especially fantasy and sci-fi, I'll see that the characters that are kind of in that chaos bucket, they're all bad, they're all evil, right? And then it's kind of like, that's not very multidimensional. It's not very realistic. And that when we have that scenario, it can pull us out of something or a story that, you know, is meant to be immersive. And that's not what we want. So I think it just it speaks to her power of having a character for everybody. Um, even as we grow too, like I'm sure all of us, we related to different characters when we were younger and then in our teens and 20s and in our 30s. Right. We relate to different people. Um, and because we've all experienced different versions of order and chaos and good and evil, I don't know. Pretty cool. I also think it's important to pay attention to perceptions. And we are in third person limited for the majority. Like we call this a third person limited POV. And very occasionally, super smoothly, we step out of that. We go into Hermione's, for instance, in Sorcerer's Stone during the Quidditch match where Harry Potter is on his broom because we need to follow Hermione as she sets Snape's cape on fire. Um, we have our, we like to call them prologue and disguises for the opening chapters because Harry Potter's a baby, so we can't have as people. So they're very, very, very subtle and smooth transitions, of, like differences in POV throughout the story, but dominantly we're in third person POV. And that means that we're limited to Harry's perception. And this is the difference and one of the most valuable tools that I have taken from StoryGrid is the difference between looking at the author's perspective, the character's perspective, which is like the literal perspective, right? And the reader's perspective. And when you're Right in something like Harry Potter, we're aligned with Harry Potter's perspectives. We have character POV and we have reader POV, and they're pretty similar. Now, one of the main subplots in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and really in all the series, is the mystery subplot. And that is the idea of who is after the Sorcerer's Stone. So, like, this is the OC, again, once again, very tightly woven subplots and main plots. When is, or when are we in the bucket of we're dealing with the action stakes of? how the Sorcerer's Stone is impacting the story and when are we in the bucket of mystery and when are we just in the same bucket in the same scene, but it's just whatever you want to choose to prioritize for your main stakes. And one of the main uh, you know, skills that I think Rowling has is how to execute that. And we believe that Snape is after the stone because Harry desperately believes that Snape is after the stone, right? So we're having this aligned misdirection. Now, with order and chaos, I think that this is the thing is that sometimes a character can actually actually be out creating with the best intentions order for you, but you be, you're creating chaos because you're assuming the opposite. And Snape and Harry are perfect examples of that because Dumbledore knows and trusts Snape more than any other character in the entire series, right? And he knows that Snape is doing everything he can to protect Harry. Harry believes Snape is doing everything he can to kill him. So I think that ultimately, at least like we get to a place where he believes that. So I think that ultimately that is going to create, Harry's going to create chaos. He's going to manifest chaos for himself because of his assumptions, right? And Snape is actually saving him in the broom seat in, with Quidditch, right? Snape is saving him multiple times. When we see Snape, when Harry overlooks Snape and Quirrell having their argument, 
He assumes that Quirrell's getting bullied, and he starts to give him friendly smiles of encouragement. Where Voldemort is on the back of Quirrell's head, and is like, out to kill him. So, I think that this it's just really interesting how you can play with different perceptions of order and chaos as well. And based on all you know, the information that you have, you actually can create chaos for yourself when other creator when other characters are creating or trying to create order for you. You know, and I, I think part of the beauty of YA as well, I've talked about um, with our Harry Potter team when we've when we've been discuss- had discussions. If Harry did ever just went to Dumbledore and was like, "Hey, here's the information I have. These things are what's up. I'm a little worried about them." The story doesn't exist because Dumbledore takes care of it. Dumbledore figures it out in two seconds, right? But because we're dealing with children and adults and we worry about certain things, we worry about, um, you know, feeling like we're not living up to our expectations or there's anxiety and pressures dealing with, uh, you know, what we share, what we don't share. This is really loud, at least in Chamber of Secrets. That is going to create, we're going to create chaos for ourselves. This is a lesson I learn continuously as I grow up and I will forever be growing up. I feel like sometimes I'm still a child, still learning this lesson. But withholding, again, withholding information, that creates chaos for you often. When when do you share and what do you share and how much do you share and what you're trying to do in order to protect from someone because you don't share certain things, that is going to create order and chaos as well. So when you talk about good versus, you know, bad, those buckets in order and chaos, I think if you were to grit, you know, grit it out or, you know, put them in the quadrants and see where someone falls, the answer is everyone is always both right? How, where you fall in that line might be different, but I think ultimately the answer is it's both. And then it's just a matter of where are you in different scenes? And like you said, characters change, you know, um, Draco becomes a better character than he is in the beginning. And I think that if you look at someone like Hagrid, um, he's always kept in chaos, but he also always has the best intentions. So ultimately, like you can, you can, um, you can depend on Hagrid. I love that you brought up yeah. their perceptions of things because this is what causes so much of Harry's problems and gets him into these life and death situations. Is he does have the good intentions? He does want to bring about order, but his um, naivete or his like not understanding of all the facts um, and his misguided perceptions of Snape those are what get him into the chaos territory and put him in dangerous situations. So it's super interesting to think about, like if I'm a writer, I'm, I'm probably thinking, how do I use these tools or these this lens of order and chaos? And I think if I were to take away the two like bullet points of what we said, it's um, how do I kind of make sure I have everybody in that like four grid, um, if we said, you know, good good and bad order and chaos, how do I make sure I have characters all across that? And then how do I play with, how those um, things are changing, whether in reality or via perception. And that's a pretty cool tool to have. And I mean, look at someone like Dumbledore. So Dumbledore to me is the ultimate mentor, right? And he, one of his superpowers, if not his ultimate superpower, is that he believes in people. And he believes, well, Harry will make the right choice. He doesn't ever try to tell him what to do. He's probably the only character that never tries to tell him what to do. But he gives him what he needs in order to make his own decisions. And that can create chaos, right? But ultimately, if he tries to tell Harry what to do, we don't have the end result, I think. Because Harry has to choose to be who Harry wants to be. And forcing him to do otherwise is going to end in failure. So like even something like you look at Sorcerer's Stone, the Mirror of Erisens. Dumbledore, you know, we have Christmas. Dumbledore mysteriously gives him the cloak that's going to allow him to have a little rebellion, to have a little fun. He's expecting that based on what he knows about Harry because he's always observant, right? But when he sees that Harry's starting to get too obsessed with Mirror of Erised, we have an interference. He doesn't necessarily say... Like, you need to stop. It's not a command. I think it's like the ultimate, like, parenting lesson, honestly. It's not a command. It's like, I hope that I can see you be making other choices. Like, it's it's always, like, this is your choice. But here's what I've learned that I've seen witches and wizards waste their lives, you know, wishing for something that they're never going to get. 
he's speaking from experience. He never shares his experience. We, the whole thing about him seeing socks in the mirror, we know that that's not true by book seven. And I think that that's part of the beauty. If you look at any character as an example of this, Dumbledore is perfect because he is allowing Harry to make those choices while also only stepping in when he needs to step in. Uh, I think that's a fun point because the, the vibe you get when you read the Mirror of Error said scene is that Dumbledore's a little disappointed. He doesn't want to see Harry do this. And he kind of allows Harry to take make the choice of where do you want to be, kid? What kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be, you know, this person that sits here and dwells on your dreams and the life that you never had? And that is part of the key lesson for Harry in the book, too, because if he doesn't learn to let go of that or accept where he is today and that he has no parents and things like that, he would still see his parents in the mirror of error set at the end of the book. So it's I we always say Dumbledore is like the best mentor, even though he makes mistakes, which means he's human. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great point, Abigail. Yeah. And I also like this idea. You you kind of brought it up, Abigail, when you were talking about how um, each of the characters are kind of dealing with when do you say what you know? When do you keep secrets like these problems? And that's one of the things we look at in Story Grid is how, like, each character needs to be dealing with the core problem of the book in their own way. Because that's what allows us as readers to experience the story um, from a different perspective. And so when you're thinking through all of these different characters again, how do you feel like, um, cause I would say again, if we're on that good side, they're all trying to fight evil, but they're all going about it in completely different ways. Um, and, uh, even I had never even thought so much about Dumbledore, how he never told Harry what to do. And then, um, and then, then of course you have Snape and then you have McGonagall and you have Hagrid and you have all of these people that want good, but they're going about it in completely different ways. Um, how does that, like as if I'm a you know if I'm a writer and I'm thinking about my next book and the kind of characters I need like what does that mean for the characters I'm developing as far as thinking through like how they need to be different because if you have two characters that are exactly the same dealing with the prop the main problem of the book in a in the same way yeah. th- there's really no point uh, in having them so how do you think that as far as like you know when you're editing books and you're looking you're like okay these characters don't need to both be in here or you need an extra character here. Like how do you, how do you go through that? Yeah. And how, how can I look at that through the lens of Harry Potter? I think it goes, goes back to character work and finding that their backstory, right? So if we just look at Harry, Ron and Hermione and how they deal with the, the, you know, thought of, do we tell people what we're thinking and discovering or not? Hermione is by the book. She's very much order and good, right? So she's always like, we need to tell somebody. We need to do something. The answer's in the books. Um, And that has served her very well in her entire life. She has uh, parents who will listen, even if they don't get wizarding problems, but they're all very open with each other. And then you have someone like Ron, who he's always just kind of a little bit chaotic. And he likes to be loud because he's the youngest boy and he's never heard and You know, and so he wants to be seen. He wants to make an impact and be known for something. So he's always like, let's go fight the bad guy and let's like make the most chaos we can. Um, You know, and then there's Harry who has been ignored and put in a cupboard under the stairs his whole life and cannot trust the adults he was raised with. So he's like, I don't think this is the right thing to do yet. We don't have evidence. I'm not bringing this to an adult. If, if, you know, if I'm just going to get yelled at, he doesn't know for sure that he won't get yelled at. So I think it comes down to how you're developing your characters and what is that like backstory that creates that inner obstacle that's at the core of who they are and that filters through how they make decisions. You know, because, <clears throat> excuse me, if Harry was someone who was more confident and embraced himself as a wizard, he wouldn't make the decisions we see on the page. And I'll let you take it away as my voice disappears, Abigail. Yeah. Well, I think that's the key there is it's about how they make decisions. Uh, the ex- personal example, uh, my coming on four, I can't believe it. My coming on four-year-old, she thinks like her dad and has that engineer brain that I'm very jealous. But I think that what's interesting is like how you would go about solving a problem because there's always a problem in some way on every in every seat. 
right? It's a global problem. This might go pop. And um, my daughter, one day, like my my husband was just like, okay, his name's Chad. He took one of her figurines, her little red figurines, and he put it up on the fan. And he said to her, she goes, I can't reach that. And he goes, okay, how do you get it down? And I couldn't believe it. She like looked around. She looked up at that. She was very, very pensive and like her thinking. And then she went to the light switch and turned on the fan and let the little marine figurine fly off the fan and then got it off the ground. And my Chad looks at me and he's like, oh my gosh, I'm so impressed. And <laughs> look at them and I'm like, I would have never have thought of that. And he goes, you wouldn't have thought of that. Like, that is the main solution. Turn, Make the fan do the work. And I was like, no, I honestly think I would have spent the entire day like trying to think about how could I climb up there and reach it. And it's just like, and I'm very jealous that that was the thought process that my four-year-old was having because it is the faster solution, but that's not how my brain works. And I think this is why people are so, uh, they just, they, they really, they so love personality tests when they come to character development. I do think that you can go down a word hole and sometimes like hyper-focus on that and then try to do it exactly so, but people are complicated. I love personality tests regardless. And I think that it's a great starting point for you where it's like, okay, we have personalities, whether or not you're going to use Enneagram or you're going to use Myers-Briggs, probably the two big ones. And we can see like, at least think like, the character is different. But when it comes down to the core of it, personality-wise, that personality is built off of who they are at their core and their upbringing, right? Because that is going to help you make decisions differently based on influences. And that doesn't mean you can't grow and learn to make different decisions in different ways because of who you're immersing yourself with in your groups throughout the story. But it's just, it's all, it comes down to how you make decisions. You might make the same decision, but you might execute how you make that decision different. And I think that that's the key of looking at, do you have a variety of a cast, right? And often when you put characters together, would you come up to a different solution or will there be debate about how something has gone about, right? We see Ron and Hermione and Harry do that all the time. They have to kind of put themselves in check. What is the best, what, as they're trying to discover who Nicholas Flamel is or, you know, what, what they're doing, what's he hiding, source or stone. That whole mystery is based on them going about things differently. If you go to the middle of the book and you have the midnight duel, right? I think that Hermione is going to say, don't go to this. Like, this is a dumb decision. Why do you, why are you going out there? And Harry and Ron have a little bit more of their pride they need to preserve. So they're going to go face that, which is going to lead them to a trap, right? So I think that that's what you're always kind of thinking about is that how you make decisions and that's where the action comes into play. And are we doing that differently enough? And if not, then you need to morph characters together. Yeah. And I like what you just said, a key word about it's who you immerse yourself with, because if Harry would have gone into Slytherin, he would have been with Draco and Crabbe and Goyle. And, you know, he would have maybe known more about the conflict or he would have you know, value different things based on how he was um, growing and changing at Hogwarts, right? So kind of when you're the architect of your story, you can think like, what do I need to accomplish? If I'm rolling, I need to accomplish Harry leaning into good, Harry solving the puzzle, Harry embracing his identity, and what kind of people are going to help me do that. And then as his two best friends, they each kind of, you know, in different ways, help him get to that result, but also help express the theme of, you know, what it takes to survive and what it takes to own your identity and things like that. So um, you can kind of look at it however you want. You can go ground up and look at your character's backstory. And I think you should do both at some point. Um, but look at how they were raised, their backstory, and then look at the bigger picture and say, what do I actually need these people to do? And what's the why behind their role in the story? And then massage it till you get to the right answer. This was the first in a two-part series interviewing Savannah Gilbo and Abigail K. Perry about their work on the Masterwork Guide to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. The first thing you need to do is go down the description and order your own copy of this book and maybe buy an extra one for a friend of yours. Also, if you want to learn how to critique your own writing scene by scene, I have a great tool for you. We have a 13-part scene writing checklist that you can download right now. Go to the link down the description or on your screen right here. 
and download your copy of this 13 part scene writing checklist. Also, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future episodes around Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and all of the videos that we come out with on this channel to help you level up your skills as a writer. But as always, thanks for being a part of our community here at StoryGrid, and I'll see you next time.